This conference will now be recorded. All right, Minister McCormick, if you lead us in prayer, we'll, we'll begin. Thank you. Shall we pray? Father, we come thanking you for this another day. Thank you, God, for how you woke us up this morning and start us out on another day's journey. Thank you for this opportunity to come together, God, to study your word, asking that what is being said will be able to bless us and edify us, touch our teacher, our pastor today as he comes and shares with us what you have given him. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Listen, we're going to be in our, our study today, 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we'll be in verses 12, 1 through 12 today. And um, we do want to also let you know that um, we're going to take this in some pieces. So let me go over real quick the uh, Bible study plan for 1 Peter today. Um, May the 13th, we're going to be covering chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. And then uh, the rest of the weeks will be uh, as you see on the outline. I also think that this uh, will give us a chance to study this a little more in depth and uh, not rush through it. And we'll try to cover 1 Peter in about 10 weeks, uh, which will carry us through July. And then we'll go through uh, 2 Peter, which is a little bit uh, shorter. Uh, 2 Peter, uh, when we finish 2 Peter, we'll do like we do sometimes to take a Bible study break. Uh, and then we'll pick up the next series after that. So just so glad you could join us today uh, in this study on First Peter. So let's get into our text and I'm gonna switch and uh, read it from our uh, Logos Bible study software um, so that we can zoom it in a little bit more and everybody can see it a little bit better, especially those of us who have uh, aging eyes. <laughs> So we'll be reading from the English Standard Version, and uh, we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 1, okay? Um, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may, <laughs> may be found to result in praise and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that now have been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. All right, God bless you. Uh, so let's get into our uh, uh, this first piece and let's preview, if you don't mind, we'll preview our discussion questions at the end and uh, we'll front load those now and then we'll go back and teach through them. So uh, our discussion questions, and I know some of you all have worked on these in your groups already. So our discussion questions start with question number one, to, which we've given you some maps included in the Bible study to which areas was Peter writing and where are those areas today? Uh, question number two, what are the location what does the location of those to whom he wrote tell us about their background? What does their location 
tell us about their background. And then uh, question three, when we read 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12, and study Peter's description of the people who were to receive his letter, how does this description of them help explain why they were strangers in the world, okay? Uh, question four, and for those who are just joining us, we're just front-loading our discussion questions. What roles do each person of the Godhead play in the lives of believers according to verses one through two? Uh, question number five, Peter says that God has given his people new birth. And what all does he say grows out of that new birth? There are some things that come as a result of the new birth. We'll discuss those. And then question six, into what does Peter, uh, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 indicate we have been born into? That should have been question five, and I flip-flopped them, but we'll make it. Question seven, how does, though, how does what we are born into in verses three through five prepare us for what we may go through in verses six through seven? And then question eight, how does how is or how does the tested genuous genuineness of our faith in verse seven how is it demonstrated in verse eight through nine i'm going to change that uh all right question number nine uh we ask you to do some background reading in isaiah chapter 52 through 13 through the end of chapter 53 how does it relate to peter's statement in verse 10 about our salvation we're also going to give you another passage in Ezekiel to accompany that. And then question number 10, on page 24 of Dr. Constable's notes uh, on 1 Peter, what is it that most Christians do not realize that God intends for our experience? Uh, he drops a bomb on page 24 in the notes. So I'll go back to the beginning and show you how to get the notes. Question 11. Read 1 Peter 1 through 12 and 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. What did God use the prophets to do uh, that Peter speaks of that's helpful for us, okay? And then question 12, what did the prophets realize in 1 Peter 1, 12 that relates to us today? And then the last question, which is more personal application, how does this help us cope with the tension of suffering as a Christian? So. Uh, let's go back now and remember how we got our notes um, on our uh, SBC Ipsy webpage. Uh, uh, on our SBC Ipsy webpage, we went to the uh, Bible study link and uh, there we go. Under events, go to Bible study. And if you go to events and then Bible study, uh, we have the, the uh, introduction notes there. You can click here to download Dr. Constable's notes on the lesson. And when you click there, it gives you the option of going right to a Plano Bible Church, getting those notes if you want to. You can save a copy of the notes and download them, or you can just use them on the screen. If you are using those notes and you decide to, I think somewhere on that page, there's an option to uh, donate to uh, support uh, the work that they're doing. So uh, we thank God for Dr. Thomas Constable. Um, everybody... Mr. Yes, sir, Rev, go ahead. Uh, and for those who are using the new app, Mm -hmm. um, from the home screen, you click on connect, and then on connect, you click on Bible study. And if you click on the First Peter uh, lesson, um, the notes are right there in the each lesson. Uh, download it. lesson notes and also download Dr. Constable's notes. Thank uh, you. It'll be right there in there. So. So we go to the app which I'm holding in my hand, and then we go to connect connect okay and then bible study right i i don't have today's out there yet uh but uh right. um it'll be out there momentarily okay awesome yeah. but the one from last week is out there and that's the way it'll be going forward we will probably be on the new website next week anyway so awesome thank you sir thank sure. you mm -hmm. all right 
So let's go back and grab verses one through two and talk about these a little bit. And what I'm gonna do for us is do a little teach through and then I'll pull in, uh, we'll go back and read our discussion questions and look at those. So in 1 Peter 1, 1 through 2, Peter is talking to us about the fact that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He is writing uh, to the elect exiles of the dispersion in a particular area. And this geographical area is described as Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So if we look at the map, uh, that, that, that we uh, have, uh, this is the Roman province basically of Asia Minor. Uh, so this is Asia Minor, down here is Africa, uh, here's Egypt, Cyrene. This area over here is where Peter is primarily uh, writing to, okay? Um, so when he is speaking to them, um, he is writing to them and he reminds them that they are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And if you've been in our new members class, our new members discipleship class, we discussed the fact that foreknowledge uh, is God choosing and knowing those who will come to salvation um, and determining their salvation beforehand. Uh, that's the, the work of the Father. In the sanctification of the Spirit, and we've learned that sanctification is God setting us apart for his purpose, uh, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. And we're going to come back to that, that, that concept of sprinkling in a little bit, little bit. So we see all three persons of the Godhead uh, involved in uh, this, this salvation that we now enjoy. Okay. Um, um, and he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Then in verse three through nine, he says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. And then this is the uh, key phrase in this chapter one through 12. You might want to write this key, this key phrase now to a living hope. So Peter is trying to introduce to these exiled uh, Jewish and Gentile believers that even though we may be exiled temporarily, we may be outside of uh, our normal setting where we would prefer to be, that uh, we still have our hope in Christ because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And as a result, uh, we have an inheritance uh, from him. Now, this inheritance in the uh, uh, Greek, if you study the, the notes, you already know that he's using an alliteration to describe the fact that what we have in Christ is imperishable. Um, it will not be destroyed. It's not going to fade away. Um, it cannot be polluted. And it cannot be looted either. It cannot be stolen. Um, and it is kept, it's guarded in heaven by God himself. Uh, and one of the things that we have to recognize in this particular passage is that we, our salvation is being guarded by God's power. Uh, but that salvation is forward looking. Remember that Peter is looking at glorification realities, that our salvation will be revealed in the last time. And so because God is guarding us, uh, we can rejoice in the midst of our grief. Uh, because God is keeping us, we can rejoice in the midst of the calamity that's going on around us. Why should we do that? So that the tested, verse seven, genuineness of our faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, that our genuineness, our genuine faith, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when Christ comes back, uh, we will be able to see and people will be able to see that our faith was not fake. Imagine if Christ showed up today and all of these folks that have been uh, making fun of you for participating in Bible study and you spending your lunch break tuned into that church every time something's going on you clicking on go to meeting uh um uh, you're down there volunteering and doing different things well listen when christ returns our faith will be validated and even though we have not seen him we love him and even though we do not see him now we believe in him and he is the 
the center of our joy. Um, and, and, and that uh, joy guarantees that we're going to receive the outcome of our faith, which is the salvation of our souls. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so Peter is pointing forward to what we can expect, but he's also pointing backwards because in verses 10 through 12, he's talking about <laughs> that concerning this salvation, the prophets prophesied about the grace that was ours. So let's unpack this a little deeper and uh, get back into this a little bit. So remember, the book is written by Peter, uh, the apostle of Jesus Christ. His given name was Simon, uh, but Jesus renames him Cephas or Petros, which means rock, uh, because Jesus redefines his shifty character. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I always argue, and some folks get mad with me, that we ought to be careful how we name our children. We ought to give them names that speak of their destiny and their character rather than something that just sounds cool. Uh, when I was young, I, I wanted to be named Tyrone. And when Erica came out with that song, I was so glad that my folks didn't name me Tyrone, okay? Um, so Jesus' description of Simon's future strength in his personal name um, is, is, is found uh, in the New Testament as the only person named Peter, okay? So he's the author. Remember, too, that Peter was raised in Galilee. Um, he was the brother of Andrew. Um, they were they were fishermen. They had a business together. He was an entrepreneur, and he was married and had uh, a, a wife and family. Um, we know that, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the gospel writers, uh, John Mark, may have been his nephew, um, um, may have been related to him somehow. Um, and so um, um, Peter is the first apostle that is called, the first disciple called, and it's interesting that Peter, who uh, uh, in his, before the cross, who objected to the suffering of Christ, makes the center of Christ's suffering, makes the center of his epistle, the suffering of Christ. So Peter, who objected and said, Lord, I'm not gonna let you suffer. Um, later on, after the spirit of God has informed him and he has been taught by Jesus, he understands better that suffering is part of our salvation. Uh, just to rewind, the book was written around AD 64 uh, during the persecution of uh, Nero, the beginning of it, shortly after that, and um, that this persecution was more social and religious rather than legal. Uh, and he, he, he writes most likely from Rome, uh, the emperor's headquarters, and so he's careful about how he's doing that. So remember that the book is written to Christians scattered throughout the provinces, as we showed you. Uh, these five provinces on this side of the map. Um, and what, what area would that be known as today? What is this area, these five provinces? I know you studied it in your groups already. What is that area? Modern day Turkey. That would be modern day Turkey. Thank you. So. This area of Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, over here we have Iran, Iraq, Syria, down here is Lebanon and Israel and Jordan. Um, this area from where we see Syria, part of Iraq, part of Iran, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, this is primarily the area, uh, perhaps a piece of Bulgaria, uh, that 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 Peter was writing to. This is where these folks had scattered from. And so um, um, if you were to go today to this area, uh, there are churches there to this day that go way back in time uh, to the time that Peter was writing. That first century church was in this area, okay? Um, so he's he's writing to people who are scattered because of their faith, okay? And remember that he is writing for the purpose of encouraging them to stand firm on their faith, uh, stand firm in God's grace. And remember that this concept of the grace of God uh, plays out over and over uh, in First Peter. 
Um, and so the letter stresses life triumph in conduct, in character, and in conflict, okay? Uh, so we've talked about who these folks were. We've looked a little bit more about uh, Peter's wish for them is that they would see God's grace multiplied to them. Let's look a little bit more about uh, uh, these, these recipients because there are some verses that describe them. So in verses one through two, he describes them as elect exiles, elect exiles. He also describes their geographical location. He describes their salvation and the fact that God has chosen them for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with his blood, which has to do with cleansing, and we'll talk more about that. Um, um, he also describes the fact that they are to be joyful in the midst of their trials. And let's, let's be honest, with some of the things that we're going through now, some people have been laid off from their jobs. Uh, some people are, uh, are having emotional um, and mental concerns because of uh, what's happening around us. Uh, but Peter, uh, this book reminds us that we can have joy in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our grief, because our salvation in Christ and our position in him is secure. Um, he also describes them as having not seen Christ, yet loving him and uh, working toward the outcome of our faith. Uh, he, he describes the, to them who they are. Now check this out. Peter nor Paul is thought to have ever traveled through this region and established these churches to whom they are writing to. So how did he know about the situation of these churches? I want to talk to me a little bit. How would he have known about the situation of these churches? Is it possible that the same way, go ahead, go ahead. Probably through, through mail, through information that was uh, brought to him by travelers that had been on that route. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Go ahead. I was going to for other missionaries that had traveled through the region. And yeah. also by word of Yes, other missionaries that traveled to the region. Remember that this region is on the trade route. So if you're going from Jerusalem overland to Rome and you're choosing not to travel through uh, the dangerous uh, uh, seas, Christians were spread throughout this region. We know they were riding one another back and forth, as you all said. We know that that word of mouth was there. And so that, that constant communication of the body of Christ uh, had made Peter aware of what was going on with these folks. Wouldn't they have also been aware because he knew that they were going into uh, the land that they were going in. These were not believers that they were living in the midst of. They had already been, they had dispersed because they had been persecuted. So they had been run, run away from their homes. So they were, in a place that they had never been before. And that's going to cause problems. Being in a place you've never been in before with the people whose land you're occupying don't really like you that well. Yeah, and so they 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 uh, uh, really needed to have um, um, that communication, that constant interaction with one another because of what they were facing externally. And I think that you all are hitting on some great points. Uh, they, they needed to be in communication with one another, just as we do today. Uh, so those, those are the recipients. That's, that's how he talks to, about them. He also talks about the role of the Godhead um, um, in their salvation. So remember that the Father elects them. Um, the Father knows them beforehand. He determines them. 
for salvation as we see in the book of Ephesians as well. Um, and, and, and then the spirit sanctifies. Let's talk a little bit about sanctification. What does that mean, sanctification, that term? Uh, process of becoming holy. Yes, yes, Brother Ellis, it has to do with becoming holy. It's the process that God is making us more like him. Yeah, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit is uh, the fact that he leads us to develop in our faith so that we look more like him. And then the, the, the other piece of this is that, the, 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 that Christ calls us to obedience and cleanses us by his blood. Remember that our sins are forgiven because of Christ's uh, death on the cross, which pays our debt that we owe, um, both because we inherited as Romans chapter five teaches us Adam's sin, but also as Romans chapter six teaches us because we added to it by affirming Adam's choice to sin because we sin. And so as Romans chapter eight reminds us, because of Christ, we have been cleansed and Romans chapter six tells us we have been set free. So uh, um, that's the role of the Godhead in the life of these believers. And Peter does not want them to forget that Father, Son, and Spirit, all three uh, are working in concert uh, to obtain our salvation in the future, not just in the present, okay? So what are some of the results of this this new birth. Uh, we talked about the fact that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And so this, this hope is not just past oriented, but it is our present reality. Okay. Um, let me ask you a question. What is hope? What is hope? Hope. Hope in the in the Greek uh, word uh, is has a much stronger meaning. It means to have a certain expectation. It is an anticipation of something you are completely certain about about it, and you have no doubt about it. All right, thank you, Brother Foley. It's a complete certainty. Yes, sir, Doctor Foley. Thank you. Who else wants to chime in on hope? What is hope? Now, let me say one more thing about what, what, what Brother Foley said. It's a complete certainty, even though it's not already a reality. And in this passage, hope is tied up in the resurrection of Christ because he got up. Our hope is certain, okay? But one of the other realities of the new birth is our inheritance um, um, that we have, and we've already des described those words, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Um, 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 and the fact that not only is the inheritance guarded, but that we are being guarded uh, by our faith for a salvation that will be revealed uh, when Christ comes. And so this, this is part of our, of our, uh, uh, our package, our benefit package because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? This is the results of the new birth. And sometimes we don't think about the fact that I, I became a believer in Jesus, and now I've got some, you know, heaven is my home. Yeah, but listen, there's some stuff the Lord is doing for me right now, okay? Uh, so that's, that's some of the results of the new birth. But in addition to the new birth, one of the things we also have to recognize is that the new birth helps us deal with trials. So you might want to write this down, that gar God guards us in the midst of our grief. God guards us in the midst of our grief. If we, go ahead. Go ahead. He gives us a new spiritual life that he enables us. us to live yes. in, this, in this physical dimension. 
He gives us a new spiritual life that enables us to live in this spiritual dimension. I like that. I like that. If we keep watching CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and all of these CBS News, the news can depress you. It can make you uh, uh, want to just go in your room and cry if you keep watching all the stuff that they have on TV. Can you imagine what it was like for these folks to, who had been displaced, run out of their homes, run out of their neighborhoods? In some cases, you had uh, husbands that were being cruel to their wives because their wives, their wives had now claimed Christ. And you had people who are in the situation of uh, being indentured servants or slaves whose masters were, were, were mean, ornery, ugly, and obstinate because you're supposed to be a Christian, so let's see how much you can take. Uh, and then you had uh, husbands who, who had come to faith in Christ, and, and now your wife wants to act a fool to try to test what you say you believe. These are the social situations that these Christians found themselves in. And so they, their, their faith, was being tested, uh, and 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 notice that that Peter uses the phrase by fire. They weren't going through easy stuff, okay. And so um, the the but listen, you might write this down too. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Yeah, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. We need to understand that 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 what makes our faith so precious is that it withstands the trials that we go through, that we don't cave in, that we don't give up, that we don't throw in the towel, um, uh, we don't abandon our faith, but we keep holding on to it because it's real. And that, that holding on to our faith uh, glorifies Christ, okay? But it not only glorifies him, when he appears, we will be glorified with him. And so uh, um, Peter really is, is, is doing an awesome job of reminding these believers and us uh, that, that God is guarding us in the midst of our grief. Now, let's, let's be honest. There's no exemption from it. One of the things that's mind blowing for some people is they feel like because I'm a Christian, I'm going to get to skip the hard part. Uh, but 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 the reality is this: life has something waiting for all of us. It ha it has some rough stuff for all of us. So this this new birth that we've experienced, God guards us in the midst of our grief. Okay, and so our our genuine faith has been tested and approved. It's been tested and approved, and when Christ appears. It will, it will uh, honor him and we will experience glory. So in, as, 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 as Peter is wrapping this section up, he points backwards. He's been pointing forward toward glorification realities, but now he takes a look backwards and pulls in some Old Testament concepts. And that is that the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, were prophesying about the grace that would be ours, okay? They were looking forward. And I was, I was talking to a buddy of mine today who's Jewish, and I was explaining to him that the 613 laws of the Old Testament pointed toward our need for Christ, the Messiah. Um, and so uh, uh, this, this Old Testament concept it, it, it predicted the sufferings of Christ and, and the subsequent glories, but it also showed the Old Testament prophets um, um, that they were not serving themselves, but a future generation that was to come. So let's look at a couple of passages uh, that deal with that. So, uh, um, um, and I'm gonna throw this in real quick. This is from Dr. Constable's notes on page uh, 24. Um, uh, one of the major concepts about salvation that Peter wanted his um, uh, readers to remember is that uh, uh, that our salvation includes suffering as well as glory. So when you go back and you read Isaiah chapter 
9, Isaiah chapter 50, Isaiah chapter 51, Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah 53, 54, 55, which we've been reading, by the way, <laughs> during our prayer call uh, in Isaiah chapter 61, which we will read you see that the Messiah experiences suffering and glory, okay? But they didn't understand how the glory and the suffering fit together uh, looking forward. It could only be seen after Christ was, was here. Peter wanted us to recognize that the suffering and the glory go together. He hated the idea that Christ would suffer, but later he understood. One of the things that many Christians get their minds blown over is that God intends, Lord have mercy, for our experiences as well to include both suffering and glory. Uh, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, if you're a Christian, the Bible says that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will experience persecution. So we, we have to dismiss this notion that if I'm good and I'm a Christian and I live right, I won't experience anything that's unpleasant, bad, or that may cause me to suffer. No, it's a certainty that we will, but the suffering does not compare to the glory that will be revealed later. And Peter deals with that concept a little later in the book. So what did the what did the Old Testament prophets say? So let's look at Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 through 15 for a minute. Okay, Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 15. Behold, my servant, and this is speaking of Christ, shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. So this concept of sprinkling has to do with the mercy seat and the fact that the high priest would go in once a year and offer the blood of the animals of sacrifice to cover the sins of the nation of Israel. But what Isaiah chapter 52 is teaching us in verses 13 through 15 is that the same one who is exalted will have his blood sprinkled over the nations, not just Israel, okay? Um, 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 and, and, and it will be astonishing because um, what had not been told was that Gentiles would come into the faith. Okay, Ezekiel 36, write this one down. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 23 through 28. Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel 36, 23 through 28. By the way, you can screenshot these and take pictures of the, of the slides if that helps you. Um, Ezekiel 36, 23 through 28. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and will gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put within you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I shall give, the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people and I will be your God. So in a way, Peter is uh, referring back to the fact that both Isaiah and Ezekiel speak of the fact that God kind of creates a new kind of Jew that is a new kind of nation as well that is based not just on ethnicity, but on faith. So those who come to salvation are not based on ethnicity, but on faith. Uh, 
I want to I want to say that again because there's this movement now that says you need to be a Hebrew to be saved. But here we see in Ezekiel that God calls us from different nations, and uh, um, that's that's part of our salvation reality. All right. Uh, so in 1 Peter 1 and 12 and in 19 through 21, he talks about uh, 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, he talks about this concept of what the prophets saw, okay? So what the prophets saw. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Remember that angels don't experience redemption and salvation. So as we studied yesterday in our new members discipleship class about angels, angels are eternal beings. They cannot die, but they also, if they uh, uh, leave their, their assignment, cannot be redeemed. Uh, only only uh, us as Christians have that opportunity. Only human beings have the opportunity to experience redemption. And so Peter in 1 Peter 1 and 12 is talking about the fact that the Old Testament prophets and those that the Lord used to preach his word had us in mind, okay? But it wasn't their word that they were preaching. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 through 21, he says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture come from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spake from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this word that they were preaching came directly from God. And that, brothers and sisters, uh, goes back to the doctrine that we call inspiration, that it was breathed out by God. And because of that, we also believe that it is in the inerrant uh, word of God, inerrant in the original writings. Uh, all right, listen, I don't want to talk too much. Uh, we need to get some, some uh, questions and answers, some discussion here. So is there any question about anything that we presented so far before we go into our discussion questions? All right, all right. I see y'all writing. I see a few people saying, okay, pastor, go get to those discussion questions so I can get these answers now. All right. I'm gonna ask the question if you all are gonna answer them though, okay? If we get stuck somewhere, I'll chime in. Question one. When we look at the maps provided, to which areas was Peter writing? Where are those areas today? Come on, talk to me. Click that, click that, that red button, turn it green and talk to me. Modern day Turkey. Modern day Turkey. Where else? Also Syria. Mm hmm And Armenia. Mm hmm Right. In Peter's day, that area was known as what? Asia Minor. Asia Minor. Asia Minor. Okay. All right. Question number two. What does the location of those to whom he wrote tell us about their background? And that they are diaspora Jews and they're living in a foreign land. All right, Sister Ellis, that they were diaspora Jews living in a foreign land. Were all of them Jews? Were, were every last one of them Jews? There were Gentile Christians as well. There were Gentile Christians as well. They were in foreign lands, though. They were separated from their homeland. Yeah. So this area asia minor has a mixture of jewish christians and gentile christians but the, the 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 factor is that they were displaced okay all right question three 
when we read first Peter 1 through 12 and we study the description of the people who are about to receive this letter how does this description of them help explain why they were strangers in the world No matter where we live on earth, we're still strangers because this is not our home. Our final destination is heaven. All right, outstanding. Our final destination is heaven. Murphy Pace wrote one of my favorite songs that says, this world is not my home, just a pilgrim passing through, okay? All right, question number four. What roles does each person of the Godhead play in the lives of believers according to verses one through two. God the Father. Yes. Sanctification of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of his blood. All right, so the Father foreknows, the Spirit sanctifies, and Christ calls us to Obedience. Outstanding. Obedience. Outstanding. Thank you. Question number five. Peter says that God has given his people new birth. What all does he say grows out of that new birth? Well, our, our identity in Christ is all our right. living hope. He is our living hope. He is our inheritance and our salvation. All right. Thank you, Sister Herbert. Our identity, our living hope, you said also say it again our inheritance inheritance and then our salvation which is the glorification of our future uh, eternity with christ outstanding thank you so much thank you so much question six into what does first peter one through five indicate that we've been born into that was a phrase i had you write down To a living hope. To a living hope. A living hope. Uh, thank you. Thank you. A living hope. Let's keep that in mind. That's the, the key phrase for this first pericope, a living hope. Question seven. How does what we are born into in verses three through five prepare us for what we may go through in verses six through seven? Pastor, I think that was uh, because we are born into this living hope. That living hope then guards us. God guards us uh, in the midst of our grief was, was the phrase you had said. And that's how it prepares us to deal with it. Because since we have a hope, we can cling to that hope. And it uh, through the power of the spirit, he gives us the ability to have faithful conduct in the midst of our suffering. Oh, Reverend, did you say faithful conduct? In yes, the midst of them. Yeah, because see, the, the thing is, what I want to do is poke my lip out and have an attitude. Uh, but this living hope uh, redirects my conduct so that it's faithful. That's great. Thank you. Question eight. How does the tested, gen, how is the tested genuineness of our faith in verse seven demonstrated in verses eight through nine? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Okay, Dr. Smith, go ahead. Our faith is even more precious because we believe even though we have not seen. And we still rejoice in the hope through faith and love that in the end we will receive salvation for our souls, which is the end of our faith. Yeah, the faith is even that much more precious because we love him and we believe in him. Yeah, and as a result, We'll get the result of our faith when he appears. Wonderful. Question nine. When we read Isaiah 52 and the passage we read in Ezekiel, how does it relate to Peter's statement in verse 10 about our salvation? All right, let me kick in on this one. Remember that the Old Testament prophets were looking forward 
to our salvation. Um, um, they didn't understand all of it fully, but they were looking forward to what would the grace that we would receive through Christ um, as they were preaching, okay? All right. Uh, and that, that's a reminder that our job is not to uh, just expect the results or to measure the results, but our job is to put the paper on the porch, spread the good news of Jesus Christ and leave the results up to God. Then on page 24 of Dr. Constable's notes on 1 Peter, what is it that most Christians do not realize that God intends for our experience? To include, to include suffering and glory. To include suffering and glory. All right. Somebody else was adding in something too? Just the same. Okay. Now we'd like to skip that part. I mean, give me the glory. I'm good for that. I want my name in lights. I want, I want people to see what the Lord has done in my life. But sometimes we want to skip, uh, uh, you know, the hard part. Listen, I noticed the other day, I, I saw T.D. Jakes on television and he was um, sharing some words of encouragement, but in the back corner was a picture of when he first got started. And I had seen that picture before and people used to make fun of him because he started out as a ditch digger and the church met in an old uh, abandoned movie theater. Um, um, and, and he would work by day uh, uh, digging ditches and, and going to school at night and uh, had this, this big old jerry curl. And people made fun of him when he first got started. But people don't know how sometimes God can use suffering, can use our hard trials to develop what he's going to do in us later on. So if you're going through some stuff right now, I want to tell you to hold on because God is not finished with us yet. Um, One of the things that came up if, group in relation to that was that without a test, you can't have a testimony. Yeah, Sister Jackie, say that one more time. Without a test, you can't have a testimony. Yeah, yeah, there's no testimony. And listen, the testimony has I in the middle. <laughs> but And also, if Christ is our example, then Christ suffered. Yes. He suffered and then he was glorified. So if we are using him as an example for our lives, then we have to include the suffering part. Yes. And one of the things that brings us comfort is that suffering is a reality. No one is exempt from it. And so if I'm if I am going through suffering right now, or maybe have come out of a season of suffering, I'm in good company because every saint goes through those seasons. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think also, Pastor, that this suffering uh, that we may go through, this pain and suffering, develops trust that we can have in in God also, if mm -hmm. we have the faith in the first place. And I think it reminds mm -hmm. us that uh there is a purpose behind this suffering and pain, and that is to draw closer to God. Yes. And that we have to remember in times of trials, for me especially, that it's for the cause of God and for our salvation. Yeah, yeah. There's a song that said he did it for my good. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Might I, might I say that this all comes back to where we started with hope? Yes, sir. The basis of the believer's hope is Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. He yes, alone sir. provides salvation and the promise of eternal life. But look, bro, folks, don't you make me tap this computer on this desk right here. All right. <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. I, was just thinking, I was just thinking, too, that since our faith in and since our faith in Christ is so inextricably connected to suffering, um, that brings the importance of walking with God and having an established relationship with him in good and bad times. Because yes. the experiences that we have with God in the good times um, solidify our faith so that when we do end up in hard trials, there may be shifting in our surroundings, there may be things that happen in our lives, but our faith remains sure. And that was one of the things that uh, really, uh, there are some things I saw growing up with my grandmother and I asked her questions. I'd be like, well, why, how do you, how you take that? She was like, baby, I've been walking with God so long through so many ups and downs. She was like, I'm, I trust him all the way through. 
You know, yeah. no matter how, what the outcome is, good, bad, or indifferent, I'm trusting in the Lord. You know, and so that really invigorated me and really put my faith on fire because it's like, I'm gonna trust God no matter what. Yeah. Because he can be trusted, you know what I mean? Yeah. Proven reliability, yes sir, yes sir. Pastor, I'd like to say on that question that really in the life of the believing, hopeful child of God, there really is no bad. It's, that's only that which seemed to be bad because in the in the end it is for our good. I remember Jacob uh, that 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 told the angel that that whipped him says, "Don't leave me until you bless me." Yeah. Keep yeah. it coming until I'm better. Keep it coming yeah. until I I'm I'm who I need to be. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. why I say, "Hey, look, <laughs> Lord, yeah. I can see the end." Yeah. And, and it's for my good, as you said earlier. That's yeah. a sermon. And then when, when Jacob, Jacob's uh, son, Joseph, said, y'all meant it for evil. Right. <laughs> but the Lord meant it for good. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look, don't y'all tear up these computers now. Listen, question question 11. <laughs> we already answered that. I'm going to go on to question 12. Uh, what, what did the prophets realize in 1 Peter 1, 12? that relates to us today in first peter 1 12 what did they realize that they were not serving themselves they were serving us mm. and how much more the coming generation that's coming behind us that we're not doing what we're doing today this is not just for us Amen. There will be somebody behind us that will see the video, that will go back and watch, that will hear how the church moved forward in faith in the midst of a global pandemic, how the church didn't collapse, didn't quit, didn't fold up, didn't give up, but just kept on going on in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. All Even right. The, the prophets understand they still studied it carefully. Yeah. Yeah, what the they, revelations that God had given to them, they yeah. pondered and studied it carefully to get a yeah. better understanding. Oh, Sister Dean Smith, they stayed in the scriptures so that they could see what God was doing. Exactly. Amen. Amen. All right. What questions do you have for us? All right. All right. All right, Sister Lynette, I can't, I can't hear you, but I can see you, baby. I see you. <laughs> Listen, let me, uh, uh, let me remind us that next week's Bible study. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm grateful. Next week's Bible study uh, will be in uh, uh, First Peter chapter one, and we'll be covering uh, verses thirteen through twenty-five, and that. Uh, will be out on the app and on the website y'all pray for me i'm trying to get used to you know i have a, a technological background but i'm trying to get used to some of the new things we're using so next week we'll be in first peter chapter 1 13 through 25. anybody have any special prayer requests as we get ready to close yes can we pray for um, the staff and residents at Clinton Manor, there are seven staff and 13 residents that have COVID-19. All right. Yes. Hold on just a second, baby. I'm going to stop the recording just real quick. All right.